All right, so Acts chapter 24. We're being working through week by week. Uh, Nathan did last week, chapter 23. So we're up to the point of now chapter 24. And just kind of a reminder what's going on as we enter into chapter 24. Uh, Paul has been transferred to Caesarea because the Jews have made a uh, vow, 40 of them, to kill Paul. And so the, the Roman commander ordered 600 soldiers, foot soldiers, and uh, 70 cavalrymen to take him to Caesarea. And they did that. Actually, it went to Antipas first, which was like 35 miles. I don't know if I could walk 35 miles in a night. That's a pretty good hike for those soldiers. Just think about that. They're, they're pretty tough. And then the cavalry took them the rest of the way. So it was about almost halfway, and the cavalry took them the rest of the way. So, so here he is. He's, he's being brought to Caesarea before uh, Felix, who's the governor at that time. And we'll just start with verse 1. And it says, Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullius. Now, Tertullius, most scholars believe, was actually a Gentile. He has a Roman name. So they were, uh, for the most part, believing he was actually a Gentile. So he would be like the prosecuting attorney. So they brought in a professional, you know, to make the charges. And Ananias, he was in his 80s. So that's pretty good to make that journey also, uh, which also shows his uh, uh, zealousy of actually trying to persecute Paul. Okay, let's look at verses 2 through 4. Because when Paul was called in, Tertullius presented his case before Felix. Now we have enjoyed a long period of peace upon, under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we have acknowledged this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I will request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. So, Tertullius is pretty well buttering up Felix, right? Because actually his reign was just the opposite of that. It was the least peaceful. And Felix is a, a very interesting character because he was actually a slave, and it's the only case we know of where a slave was actually brought through and became a governor of a province, and this came Palestine, because his brother was a good friend of Caesar. So basically his brother gave, got Felix this job. Now, again, he did anything but have the most peaceful reign. He was very harsh to the Jewish people. Not only that, but he also took bribes, and it was against Roman law to take bribes. And in fact, his reign was so bad that in 60 AD, he wasn't really there that long, the Romans removed him from power and replaced him. But that's Felix, okay? And the Jews hated him because of the way he treated the Jews. So... This opening uh, phrase by Tertullius was really uh, anything but the truth. Okay, let's look at verses 5 through 9. It said, We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple so we seized him. Now, by examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. Now, the Jews joined in the accusations, asserting that these things were true. 
Now, I notice in the ESV version, it says, we have found this man to be a plague. Now, the sect of the Nazarene, uh, many people called Christians at the time, it was Antioch, where they were first called Christians, but they called them the sect of the Nazarenes. In some cases, they were called the way. In fact, Paul uses that term, you know, the way. So it was just a term uh, spe- specifically for Christians. Now, the most serious charge was the charge about stirring up a riot because that would disturb the Roman peace. Now, as It's interesting that the Romans actually let every nation serve their own gods. So basically, they had religious freedom in that sense. So they didn't care about these other charges, you know, about bringing somebody in the temple and, and speaking about another god who is Jesus. And, you know, that to them, that didn't matter. The thing that they were concerned about was peace in their kingdom. And stirring up a riot would be a serious charge. Now, under Jewish law, bringing someone who was a Gentile into the temple was a death penalty. But again, that's under Jewish law. Okay, let's look at verse 10 through 13. Now, when the governor motioned for him to speak... Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone in the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogue or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charge they are now making against me. So Paul makes his defense, but he doesn't really butter up Felix in the same way. But he does defend himself. He does refute these charges against him. In verse 14 through 16, However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they called a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law, and that is written in the prophets, and I have the same hope of God as these men, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clean. So a sect can be used in, in a, the actually Greek word, which actually starts with the H, I didn't write it down, but can be used in, a, in several different ways. It can be used, like in Judaism, you had the Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, and you had the Essenes, different sects of, of religion, you know, of the Jewish religion, okay? Be like us today saying the different denominations, Baptist, Methodist, you know, some with different beliefs. But sect can also be used in a negative way as being, okay, a, uh, a cult or a, uh, what is the term I would use would be a cult or a uh, also, my mind is going blank. Or heret- heret- heretics, basically. So, in other words, completely uh, separate from Judaism and from the belief of the true God. And that was more the point that he was coming at, Tertullius, making it sound like this was a, a cult or heretical group. Now, verse 17 through 19, so Paul's, again, making his defense, and it says, After absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem 
to bring my people a gift for the poor. Remember, he went to all the churches in, in Macedonia and Greece and in what was known at that time, Asia also, collecting offerings from these churches to bring back to the saints in Jerusalem and to present offerings. Now, I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you to bring charges if they have anything against me. So, so Paul was bringing a gift, and when he says there are certain Jews from Asia who should be here, because under Roman law, as a Roman citizen, you had a right as the accused to face your accuser. And these guys weren't there. And of course, their biggest charge was that they, you brought some, a Gentile into the temple. And again, he goes, hey, I, 12 days ago, I haven't had an opportunity to, to raise a crowd. I was not disturbing the peace. I was not doing any of that stuff. But under Roman law, again, he, he had the right to confront his accusers. All right, let's look at verse 20 through 21. All those who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood up before the Sanhedrin, unless it was this one thing. I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. Now, if you remember back when Paul was called into the Sanhedrin for trial, and he perceived that about half the group was Sadducees, another half was Pharisees. The Sadducees do not believe in resurrection. They don't believe in angels. The Pharisees do. And as the old saying goes, that's why the Sadducees are sad, you see. Yeah. <clears throat> so verse 22 through 23. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, he adjourned the proceedings. When Lysus, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. So basically, Felix knows there's really nothing to these charges. So he just basically delays the trial and says, I'll wait till the commander, Lysias, comes before I decide your case. And he never actually did come. So it was just a delaying tactic. Now, verse 24, several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about the faith in Christ Jesus. Now, Drusilla is a very interesting character also. She is the daughter of Herod Agrippa. Now, if you remember back in Acts, Herod Agrippa, Agrippa was the Herod that killed James, the apostle. You know, again, James was in the inner circle with Peter, John, and James, you know. He killed him. He was the first apostle martyred. And then later, Herod is given a speech and He's giving a speech, and the crowd is all saying, words of a God, not of man. And it says, the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten up with worms, and his bowels spilled out. Not the best way to go. So that's, that was her father, and she is also the sister of Agrippa II, which you're going to learn when Nathan teaches Next time on Acts. Now, Drusilla, Drusilla, 
Dushelah. It was very beautiful, they say. She had already been married. She was married. And then, because she was so beautiful, Felix arranged the divorce, her divorce, from her first husband and married her. So that was always, already kind of a, a scandal there. Now, it's interesting that Drusilla actually is killed. She only was 21 years old. When she, they went back to Italy, she happened to be in Mount Vesuvius when they had the big volcano, and she was actually killed in that volcanic uh, eruption. So, interesting story for her. All right. Verse 25 to 26. As Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe so he sent for him frequently and talked with him. So as Paul taught on faith in Christ Jesus and on righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, NIV says Felix was afraid. The English Standard Version says Felix was alarmed. The New American Standard says Felix was frightened. So obviously he was under conviction, right? But unfortunately, Felix and Drusilla both missed their opportunity. Because as he told him, that's an effort now, go, and he would come back. And if you begin to, to have that opportunity and then over time you begin to say, no, you don't agree, you won't accept that faith, over time your heart gets harder and harder. And eventually you, you don't listen anymore. And they miss an opportunity because here the Lord put Paul right within the seat of government, of the leader of the governor who's over all of Palestine, they heard the word, he took the opportunity, he preached the word, and it was not received. But he did his part. And again, I still wonder where James is at this time, but anyway, we'll go to verse 27, last verse. Man, you, got, you think guys are going to get out here early? That don't get your hopes up. Okay. <clears throat> When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. All right. So remember, I always tell you guys to always put yourself in the story. Don't just read over it, but... What would be your emotions and stuff here? And I want to read one verse out of chapter uh, 23, verse 11. Because this was back when he was, after he'd been before the, the Sanhedrin. Okay, verse 11 says, The following night, the Lord still stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. So can you imagine that? It is a Lord, resurrected Lord, appears to Paul and tells him, just as you have testified in Jerusalem, you're going to testify about me in Rome. Rome. So you can imagine at that time, you're probably flying, you're, you're on the mountaintop, 
You just heard from the Lord. The Lord's going to do this. Oh, man, I'm pumped. I've got the faith. But after two years go by, and you're no closer to Rome than you were two years ago, has your faith maybe or your maybe a little discouragement possibly come in? You know, I, I think many times we have to realize that, that our timing is not the Lord's timing. I would have thought, I got that word. Well, man, next week I'm, I'm going to Rome. And yet two years, which seems probably to yourself like wasted time, I'm still here in prison. You know, once I had a probably the most prof, you know, profound prophetic word I ever got was uh, we were at a conference. There's probably a couple thousand people there. We got called out, Glenn and I both, uh, in this conference, and he gave a public, you know, word, and, and there's a lot that was obviously very true. You know, said that your M.O. and your P.O., and I knew what that meant because I live in Missouri, I work for the post office, and went on and said that the letter killed, the spirit brings life. Uh, and he said, one of the things as it got down, and I could share all things, but one of the things it got down to was, you won't have to put up with that much longer, meaning the post office, okay? So what am I thinking? Because I was already pastoring at that time. So I'm thinking, hey, within a, a year, right? Within a year, that will happen. Well, it was nine years. Yeah, that's, um, and so our timing is not necessarily his timing. Yeah, the word was right, but it was a lot longer than what I was expecting. So you have a lot of time there to kind of begin to doubt or, you know. And if I would have tried to make that happen, it would not, I would not be here probably today would not have the freedom that I have today if I were to try <clears throat> to say, okay, well, I heard the word, the Lord, prophetic word, so I'm going to do it. Now, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to quit, you know. It would not have done, would not have been well. So as I was thinking about that, you know, in my own personal life, thinking about timing of the Lord, and again, how our timing is not the same as the Lord's time, I thought of another time because specifically because of the two years. So if you go to Genesis chapter 40, I want to look at another example. Genesis chapter 40. Now, back in chapter 39, this is a familiar story, right? Story of Joseph. Okay, Joseph is, you know, sold to the Egyptians by his brothers, and Potiphar takes him in, and and because the Lord's blessing is upon him, Potiphar's household uh, flourishes and grows and prospers, and so everything is going pretty nice, you know, right? And then Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph to come to bed with her, and he keeps refusing. And eventually he's in the house one time, and nobody else is there but him and her. And she again tries to seduce him to come to bed with her. He refuses, but she grabs her cloak, his cloak, and he runs out. And because she is so upset because... He has refused her request. Then he tells all the servants that Joseph tried to rape her. And then they tell her husband, Joseph tried to rape me. So immediately he is put into prison 
or in this case, actually, a dungeon, very dark place, okay? He's, he's totally innocent. He did the right thing, and this, is what th- and this is the thanks I get. At least that's what I'm kind of thinking. All right, so let's pick it up. Verse 1. So he's in prison, he's in the dungeon. It says, sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offered their master, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. Now the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. And after they'd been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker and the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream. The same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. So when Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why are your faces so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dream." So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dreams. He said to him, In my dream, I saw a vine in front of me, and the vine, and on the vine were three branches, and as soon as it budded, it blossomed, and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was put to my hand, and I took the grapes, I squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup into his hands. This is what it means, Joseph said to them. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hands just as you used to do when you wore his cupbearer. Verse 14. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness and mention me to Pharaoh to get me out of this prison, for I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. I think right there he's thinking, I would be thinking, okay, this is my ticket out of here. This is what God's going to use Get me out of prison. He gave these guys dreams. I interpreted my way out. Verse 16. Now, when the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh But the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is probably a prophecy you don't want. Verse 18, this is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat away your flesh. What a great word. Great word of encouragement. Now, the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the cupbearer to his position so that once again the cup, in, that he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, 
did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Just one half verse, 41. When two full years had passed. So, here I am. Here you are, Joseph. You're in prison. You're in the dungeon. You interpret these two dreams and you think, this is it. This is my ticket out of here. This is how God's going to use those dreams to get me out of here, which he eventually does. But two years had passed. Do you think in those two years, maybe Joseph was kind of doubting what's going on? I'm still in a dungeon. Two years have passed. And I haven't seen the Lord rescue me yet from this. We all know the rest of the story that he does eventually after these two years. And all of a sudden, the cupbearer remembers Joseph. But there are two years, some might say, wasted time. Not just wasted time, but I'm in a dungeon. Why didn't the Lord do it two years earlier? You know, there's some other verses, some of those things we don't like to talk about a lot. Like Hebrews 6, it says, by faith and patience. Sometimes we're not real good about having patience. Kind of like we pray, Lord, give me patience, then I want it now. Or Hebrews 11.39 where it has the list of the heroes of faith. And at the end, it said, they were all committed for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. 2 Timothy 2, verse 3. Endure, another word, endurance, endure, hardship with us. Chapter 2, 12 of 2 Timothy. If we endure, we will also Rain. Hebrews 12, 7. Endure hardship as this discipline. Revelation 3, 10. Keep my command to endure patiently. Genesis 5, 22. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness. Again, patience within that. Colossians 1, 11. May you have great endurance and patience. 1 Thessalonians 5.14, help the weak be patient with everyone. I noticed in that last song, worship song we did, there's a line in there with a song, I trust your timing. And that's where we have to come to a place of realizing, again, that our timing is not usually the Lord's timing, and that we have to truly trust the Lord in, with his timing. And for the most part, I would say, usually our timing is a lot shorter than what his time is. You know, we, we, like, we like a sprint, but the Lord says, no, this is, this is a marathon. You're called to a marathon. And in that process of getting to where the Lord is calling you, there's going to be some ups, there's going to be some downs, there's going to be some times where you have to trust, where you have to have patience, endurance, realizing that the Lord's promises are true, They just don't always come around as we think they should or in the timing that we think it should. But the Lord is faithful. And we just have to get that place where we say, yes, Lord, I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand why this is the way. I don't understand why these two years have gone by and nothing's happened. But I trust you. But I think you also have to realize human nature. And we get discouraged. And even people like Paul, Joseph, they're humans. 
They probably got discouraged at times. They probably got, Lord, what's going on? You know, Paul gives a long list of different things in his life, and he says one of the things is perplexed. Now, perplexed means I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand, Lord, what you're doing. But we have to come to that place again where we say, I don't understand, but Lord, I trust you. I submit to your will. I surrender to your will. Let your will be done, Lord. Let your timing, because your timing is never late, even though as we perceive it, it seems to be late. So trust in the Lord, be patient, grow in endurance. Remember, we are running with the marathon. There's going to be ups, there's going to be downs, there's going to be times you're not going to understand. There's going to be other times when you, when the, the word of the Lord comes and you are like on a mountaintop and you say, I will never doubt the Lord again. But then that time of delay comes in. And then you're going, did the Lord really say? No, because that's human nature. That's that's us. That's we. So stay faithful, grow in patience and endurance, knowing the Lord is faithful. Let's pray. Lord, we again thank you for your word. Lord, it is so rich. And, Lord, we thank you for these examples that we have through Scripture, Lord, of your faithfulness, of your goodness to us, of your blessings in our life, Lord, of the delays and the times when we don't understand what's going on. But, Lord, we do say we trust you, Lord. We know that you have our best interest at heart. So, Lord, we just submit to you. We surrender. We say, Lord, let your will be done in our lives, Lord. Help us to grow in patience and in endurance, faithfulness, steadfastness, that even when we don't see the things we want to see, Lord, that knowing that you are faithful, you are true. So, Lord, we thank you that you are molding us, you're shaping us to the image of Jesus. And sometimes that process is not comfortable. But again, Lord, we trust you. We know that you know the end from the beginning, that you have a plan for each one here, you have a purpose for each one, and you are working out that purpose. Help us to cooperate with what you're doing within us, Lord. Lord, we praise you. We worship you. For you are worthy of all praise and all adoration, Lord. And Lord, we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. Lord, be exalted. And as always, Lord, we pray your kingdom come, your will be done in our lives, lives of this church family, Lord, in the life of our nation, Lord. Let your will be done. Amen. Amen. Amen.